Hi, it's great to be back. We're going to be doing a little Q&A again with my son David and I, and uh, hope that some of these questions are the questions on your mind, and we're going to find some good answers from the Word of God in our study. So, uh, Dave, go ahead. Uh, yeah, our first question uh, says, it is important to stress here that you do, in fact, believe in predestination. Uh, that's what this whole lesson is about. Um, what could you say to clarify this? That's a common question people ask when they say, do you believe in predestination? What they mean is, do you believe in a certain way of understanding it? For example, if someone said to me, do you believe in the Catholic Church? Well, as long as I'm allowed to carefully define the term to mean a, the worldwide church of true believers, then that's fine. But when you use a connotation instead of the denotation, the original meaning of the word, uh, then I have a disagreement. And so it is with this word. Uh, if you're asking me, do I hold to the view that is traditionally held for predestination, then I would say, well, let's see if the Bible actually carries that idea through. And if it does, then absolutely. So you can't not believe in predestination because it's there in the Bible. The question is, what actually does God mean when he uses the word? And that's what our discussion's about. Uh, one thing that I found helpful in my research is a quote by Harry Ironside when he looks at the topic of predestination. Uh, the mentions of it in uh, the New Testament, uh, nowhere is there any reference to heaven or hell uh, in either context. So I thought that was uh, noteworthy. Right, that's helpful, yeah. Now, I really appreciated how you presented the topic of predestination in your last video as something practical and worshipful. How should the topic of predestination affect the way that I view God and live as a Christian? And that, that's exactly what Bible doctrine is supposed to be all about. It's not some sort of theory that we argue about. It's supposed to be something to be lived out. And uh, when we look at the subject of predestination, there are just two passages, so that makes it fairly simple to look at in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, and then in Ephesians chapter 1. Now, when Paul takes up the subject in Ephesians, and he talks about being chosen in him and predestined to the adoptions of sons by Jesus Christ to himself, all the way through this section 20 times over, we have this idea that the blessings that we have are in Christ. And when I look at the subject in the Word of God, it ought to result in at least three uh, reactions, I think. First of all, we ought to trust the Lord because he has looked after every detail. Secondly, we ought to cooperate with him because we recognize that even the negative things that happen to us, he's turning them to good. And thirdly, we ought to be worshipful. What a wonderful God that he would uh, take up the likes of us and have such glorious plans for us, not simply to uh, give us the Garden of Eden back, but to give us the whole universe, to give us the whole realm of his blessing. As Jesus said, um, it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Yeah, it's amazing how that takes uh, those daily occurrences and just puts them into an eternal perspective and how helpful that is. Amen to that.
Uh, now, one passage of Scripture that is often looked at concerning the idea of predestination is John chapter 6, where Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. This verse is used to imply God determined who would come to Christ. How would you interpret that verse in its context? This is one of the thorny verses, and it doesn't need to be. If we just read the next few verses, we'll see what the Lord Jesus is getting at. After he says that all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out, he goes on to say, For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. And so clearly we see two different groups of believers here. Uh, in verse 17, those that the Father gives to him and those who come to him and respond to his offer. So when the Lord Jesus came into the world, there were already people here who had a living relationship with God. They were the spiritual children of Abraham. And the Lord Jesus would say to them, you believe in God, believe also in me. Now, the Jews objected to Jesus saying this because they thought they should be in group A. Those who, in verse 39, um, had been given by the Father to the Son. But the Lord Jesus said, no, you don't know my Father. You don't have a relationship with him, because if you did, you'd recognize me. I'm so like my Father that you would have recognized me. Now, don't go away. You can still come to me, and you can individually believe on me, so that there were those who came to Jesus through the Father and there would be people who would come to the Father through Jesus. And these are the two different groups that are being discussed here. So we notice carefully that um, the first group is a collective group, all who the Father gives me. That was a one-time transfer of people who were already believers from what we would call the wife of Jehovah to become the embryonic bride. But then the second part, this is an individual choice. The one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. The same is true in verses 39 and 40. All he has given me, in verse 39, but then every one who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. So all of a sudden when we understand this transition, it's not a difficult passage at all. Hmm. And you actually have a series on these different transition passages through John. There are several of them uh, through John. You have those on the Uplook uh, site? Yes, yes. There are a series of blog articles. They're not, not videos, but uh, blog articles that carefully look at each of these passages, including another famous passage in John 10. Excellent, excellent. Um, now for our last question, uh, we're going to be looking at election in another study soon. Many use the words election and predestination interchangeably. Why would you consider this an error? Well, we need to be careful when we open the Word of God that we're thinking God's thoughts, not man's thoughts, and understanding very accurately what these technical words mean. That's the whole purpose of the study. And I have selected a book out of my library. It's an old book called The Reformed Doctrine of Predestination by Lorraine Baitner. And this would be a classic Calvinist work. 
And what's interesting about it is that this book titled Predestination hardly has one line about predestination in the whole book. And so what these uh, people have done and what gets us into difficulty is if you throw election and foreknowledge and predestination into the blender, uh, you confuse things that God distinguishes, you're going to get into trouble when you try to understand what these words actually mean. So we noticed in this word predestination, we have two passages to look at. We see what they say, and when we do, uh, we discover this is a huge blessing. Th these are not simply dry theological ideas. The idea that in election, God selected us for a role in accomplishing his purposes, whereas in predestination, the objection is sonship. He is talking about a relationship that we're going to have with him in his eternal world. So uh, it's good to see that there is a blend here. These are, these are related ideas. In fact, we'll find the two verses within a couple of sentences of each other uh, that talk about both these ideas, but we need to make them clear in our own thinking. Otherwise, it becomes very confusing. When dealing with this topic, I appreciated uh, a quote by Telford, uh, who said that uh, at a wedding, you hear what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. But uh, with this topic, he says, what God has put asunder, let no man join together. Mm -hmm. uh, so once again, uh, thank you for your time in answering these questions. And uh, make sure to uh, like the video, to share it, and uh, to leave questions in the comment section. Uh, and we look forward to our next lessons. Very good.